Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Kim Fenwick, Vice President, Academic and Research here at St. Thomas University. On behalf of President Don Russell, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Chancellor's Lecture on Indigenous Issues. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Wallistiqui, whose ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy nations, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. This is the first lecture series that we have launched in many years. The Chancellor's Lecture on Indigenous Issues now joins the Camp Lecture, Irving Lecture, and VGOD Lecture as signature events on campus and in the wider community. This evening is also special for us given the generosity that has created the new lecture series. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has called for universities to be leaders in resetting the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. For Stu, this has meant advancing reconciliation through education, dialogue, and collective action. Our Senate Committee on Reconciliation is a group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous professors, students, and staff who are leading our response to the TRC's 94 calls to action. Our Student Reconciliation Committee has also been very active. We have a strong foundation on which to build. Stu has a significant number of Indigenous students, Indigenous faculty, a chair in Native Studies, the Mi'kmaq Maliseet Bachelor of Social Work Program, the Native Studies Program, Indigenous Language Programs, courses at St. Mary's and Elsie Bucktuck First Nations, Indigenous Experiential Learning, and the Wabanaki Center on campus. With these programs and supports, we are trying to be the leaders that the TRC has called on us to be. The Chancellor's Lecture is offered in the context of our response to the TRC. But like all good things, it requires a human touch. Graydon and Beth Nicholas have been long-standing supporters of St. Thomas University, and their personal commitment to education and community service aligns with our values. Graydon is known and respected on our campus and across the country. He is a lawyer, jurist, former Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick, and member of the Order of New Brunswick and the Order of Canada. As our endowed chair in Native Studies and now Chancellor, Graydon has brought knowledge and perspective from his experience in law, social work, Indigenous rights, and public service. Beth is a lawyer who was Regional Manager of Court Services with the Provincial Department of Justice and finished her career as Deputy Registrar of the Court of Queen's Bench and Court of Appeal of New Brunswick. The Chancellor's Lecture is funded by a generous endowment established by Graydon and Beth. In addition, they have recently established the Hatchet Nicholas Bursary for Indigenous students. This endowment will fund need-based bursaries in memory of their son, Michael, and Beth's brother, Rick Hatchet. Graydon and Beth, thank you for your generosity towards Stu and our students. And I know that our president, Don Russell, wishes that she could also be here tonight to thank you and be part of this inaugural uh, lecture. Um, unfortunately, due to family circumstances, she was not able to attend. Your lives, <coughs> Graydon and Beth, are about hope, education, and building a more tolerant and understanding society. We are humbled that you are continuing that work through Stu. <coughs> We will continue our work to achieve progress toward reconciliation as a university community. We have an important role to play in educating our students and in, a ra in raising awareness in society. I would now ask our Chancellor, the Honorable Graydon Nicholas, to come forward to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Cindy Blackstock. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kim, for that nice background. I wasn't expecting it, uh, but uh, it's wonderful, I guess, to be part of uh, 
like a development, historical development on our campus of inviting Indigenous scholars, Indigenous people across our country who are gifted and work tirelessly uh, for the betterment of our Indigenous communities and children in this particular instance. And um, I first met Cindy, of course, a number of years ago when she came to speak uh, with the Indigenous social workers that had started here in New Brunswick. And I was so deeply touched by what she shared about the work that she began and is doing on benefit of our children. And uh, this is going to benefit everybody. And she'll probably share with us tonight very most recent developments, even this week, of what has occurred across this country to bring about a just situation. But Cindy is a member of the Gitscan First Nation and, of course, is, serves as the Executive Director of First Nations Child and Family Care Society and also as a professor at McGill University School of Social Work. In the past 30 years of her experience in working with Indigenous child welfare and rights of Indigenous children, she has published more than 75 articles on topics related to reconciliation, Indigenous theory, First Nations child welfare, and human rights. And of course, she's also received many honors in recognition of the work that she has done. So when we began to think last fall, who would we invite to be our first speaker? We spoke about different ones across the country, and then we said, why not invite Cindy? because she relates to everybody, Indigenous families across this great land, and also hope for our future. And I think tonight what she's going to share with us is going to be very important. I mean, she was involved with the improvement of Jordan's principle, which many of us know was very, very critical in, in the rights of children. And she has been involved, uh, and i am put this a little bit mildly, very hard hard fought litigation against the federal government. And perhaps she'll share with us how long this case has wound its way through the legal system with eventually fantastic results. She's also been recently involved in the Pan American Health Commission on health equity, inequity, and also trying to make sure that more cultural-based equity is part of our reconciliation. You can see on the screen what she's going to share with us. Spirit Bear, Echoes of the Past. And Cindy has also been involved with a number of our social workers in our province here. And so um, I just want to say, uh, Cindy, with that, thank you very much for coming here and honoring us to share with us your advocacy, your lifelong drive, determination, I call it, to say, okay, there can be a better world for our children. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, students and everybody here, I would invite our friend here, Cindy Blackstock, to come up and share with us what work she does. Thank you very much, Cindy. <laughs> So what a great honor to be here on these territories and on Graydon's mother's birthday. <laughs> you know, when we think about the stories that were told about the day that we were born and all of those who came before us, it shapes who we are. It tells us where we belonged and it gives us a guidance about where we're going. There's a lot of talk about reconciliation now, and as Graydon said, my real honor is working with First Nations folks and non-Indigenous allies across the country for children. Because one thing that I've learned about children is that they are experts in love and fairness, and they are the keepers of the possible. And so the question is, what 
legacy are we leaving all of them? And part of what I have been thinking a lot about is how Canada's creation story shapes how we think about reconciliation, shapes how we normalize discrimination in our own society, shapes how we are immobilized when we are most needed by murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, for example. And I've been blessed to kind of work with historians all over the country to talk about some of the assumptions that Canadians have and about justice, about apologies. I was in Australia recently and I turned on my TV and I saw the Pope apologizing. But was it really an apology? And what was that apology in service of? You know, when I learned, listened to the apology, it was for a few wrongdoers in the past, not for the church itself. There was no demonstration of this is what we did and this is what we learned from it and this is how we're going to reform ourselves so not only do we not hurt more indigenous children around the world, we don't hurt any children around the world. Why is it that the apology was received before all of that was demonstrated? And these apologies, they're kind of like a performance sometimes. And as the elders have said in RCAP, is that integrity is when words have meaning. So why is it that we still see this stuff flash before our screens? And what are some of the stories that the Pope told or that we saw in the media about the creation story of Canada that shapes how we uh, think today and why we aren't acting on some of these egregious human rights abuses? I think about Thomas More. This is a photo, a notorious photo. It's a before and after photo. Or at least that's what people want us to believe about Thomas More. This is, of course, Thomas uh, allegedly before and after tuition in the Regina Residential School. This is the archetype of what colonialism is, which at its very fundamental basis is a dichotomy between the savage and civilized. Everything that indigenous peoples are is savage. Everything in Western world is civilized. We even see echoes of it in academia, where we have, like the First Nation courses are elective, and then you take the real theory courses over here, right? Now, the thing about this photo is it's a, it's a real trick of propaganda. You see, both of these pictures were taken after tuition in R Regina Residential School. This is not proper regalia for this child or any child. They just wanted to use him in a marketing scheme to be able to demonstrate the process of this civilization, this betterment, as we would call it. What about this idea that people didn't know about the children in the unmarked graves? People didn't know about it. And even if they did know about it, they certainly had different values back then, right? Or there were a few bad apples. This is a headline from uh, the Ottawa Evening Citizen. Uh, oh, no, pardon me. This one's in the Victoria Columnist on the 16th of November, 1922. And uh, what they're reporting on is Canada's own chief medical health inspector, Dr. Bryce, had gone out and surveyed the health of the kids in the schools. And he found that they were receiving about one third of the health care funding of the people who live in Ottawa, like dramatically poor healthcare funding, coupled with terrible health practices, like putting sick kids in with healthy kids, uh, malnourishment of the children, it, they became what he called incubators of disease. Now, he knew what he was talking about, Dr. Bryce, because he wasn't just a backwater doctor. After all, he was president of the American Public Health Association. He was a man of science and he was convinced bringing this evidence forward to his bosses 
under the Laurier administration, they would be quick to act to remedy the inequalities, reform the health care practices, and save the children's lives. And he was horrified when they said no. Why did they say no? Well, one of the reasons was the money, of course. The cost of Dr. Bryce's reforms back then was ten to $15,000 out of a $100 million budget. But the real reason is that savage and civilized dichotomy. These kids weren't worth the money. They weren't worth the money to the government of Canada, but they were worth the money to the editors of these newspapers. And you can see here, Indian schools deal out death. These headlines are more blazing than what we saw even in the affirmation of the survivor's truce with the children in the unmarked graves. There's much more texturing of that. Oh, well, they're not mass graves, they're unmarked graves, right? That was the dialogue. And um, you can see that the death rate was 25% per year, for, and it would build to 50% over three years, where every, uh, every student who walked in, only one walked out alive. Now, let's look at what they were saying about the, the, this. This is a headline here from Saturday Night Magazine, which was published up until about a, five, six years ago. And it's dated November 23rd, 1907. And it says something very important, that it speaks to the Canadian consciousness and is just as important to the, why we turn the page on murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls today. It says, his report is printed. Many will scan the title on the cover. Some will open it. A few will read it. And so the thing will drift along for another year. And so with the next year and the year after. Such will be the course of events, the protests of medical health officers, buried in blue books, and the complaints of missionaries lost in pigeonholes. And here it is. Unless public opinion takes up the question and forces it to the front. That was the antidote to Laurier, the Prime Minister, not acting on the deaths of the children. Bryce himself would call to this. He was convinced at every turn with rising awareness of the Public Health Association that the Canadian public would be outraged, and indeed they were. 1908, a lawyer who had read these headlines, Samuel Hume Blake, who's the founder of, of Blake's law firm, which continues today, he wrote that in that Canada failed to obviate the preventable causes of death, it brought itself into unpleasant nearness with the charge of manslaughter. Think about the, the discourse with the papal apology. Shall we, the question was asked, shall we hold some of these individuals, these wrongdoers, accountable? But the question that was not asked, that needs an answer, is, is the government of Canada criminally responsible for what happened? Is the Catholic Church criminally responsible? The Anglican Church? You know, this personification of it, of being a few wrongdoers, is the way of escaping just the justice narrative. So is the healing narrative, I would say. I actually don't use the word healing. Because when we use a healing narrative with regard to the children in unmarked grace, we put the work back on the survivors. We need to take the justice narrative to put the accountability back here where it belongs so that that reformation is done, right? Now, Duncan Campbell Scott, I met him in high school literature class. And I always say to people, even back then I thought his poetry sucked. <laughs> but no one talked about his day job at Indian Affairs. That was not glad. I was, uh, I was actually into poetry back then, and I, and I loved uh, prose. I loved Pilgrim's Progress and everything else by Chaucer. And all of a sudden, I had to read this stuff. And um, I know I was supposed to like it because he's called a Confederate poet. Uh, but the fact that uh, we hear uh, him being lauded for his poetry in the absence of his day job is, is in itself telling about the way that the Canadian narrative, the propaganda that Canadians have been raised on, how it affects people. You see, because uh, when Dr. Bryce presented his report to Duncan Campbell Scott, um, he, he not only, he didn't fail to implement it. 
That's the wrong word to think about with residential schools. He chose not to do it. That's a different thing. Laurier didn't fail to save the children's lives. He chose not to save the children's lives, right? And when these people come forward, it's so interesting to me when we talk about monuments. Um, well, old John A, he, yeah, sure, he used Darien a few times. Oh, what he did with the Chinese was not very good, especially because a lot of them died building the railroad. And then, oh yeah, there was those problems with the Indians. But look what he did for our country, right? Now, the important thing about legacies is understanding they have different weights. My contribution to COVID-19 was getting my vaccines, washing my hands, wearing a mask, and staying at home. My sister's contribution as a nurse to COVID-19 was going out and treating people. She ended up getting COVID before there, and now she has long haul COVID. Different thing. She made more of a legacy in helping people during COVID-19 than I did, right? Duncan Campbell Scott's poetic prowess, however you feel about his poetry, did not have the ripple into the Canadian society as his work on residential schools did. So we have to think about the weights of these historical legacies, not ignoring them one way or the other, but weighing these various legacies that are there. Now, he was, Bryce was not the only whistleblower. The children themselves were blowing the whistle. Dr. Bryce in 1922, 100 years ago today, uh, he actually published a report called A National Crime, detailing all of his efforts to save the children's lives. And he includes in there, again, the public attention is going to turn at any time and somebody's going to do something and they'll press the government to change. And some people did, but not enough. When the headlines died, so did the kids. But this is a letter from a little kid in residential school a year after Bryce's report in the Christmas season in 1923. And I want to uh, give a moment to give credit to Dr. John Malloy, the historian, who wrote a book called A National Crime, where you can find this and more. And in there, it's a little boy, and he's writing to his parents. And as John says, you cannot, we don't know if it actually made it to his parents. What we do know, though, is what's in it, is that the child is so hungry, they're eating cats and they're eating wheat right? And that they're being treated cruelly by the teacher. And this is so rote that the one form of resistance this little boy has is not to cry anymore. He's not going to give her to his tears. What we do know about this letter is it made its way in the hands of Duncan Campbell Scott, who upon receipt said 99% of the kids in residential school are too fat anyway. Right? What happens to people in bureaucracies is that we actually, as Zygmunt Baum and the sociologist said, is when we step across the threshold, we too often replace our own ethics with loyalty to the organization. We rationalize the inexcusable to such a point that we leave our humanity behind us. And it's that first step across the threshold when we replace those ethics with the loyalty to the organization that's the hardest step. And then it becomes easier, and that becomes a little easier and a little easier. We'll talk about what that looks like in a minute. But I want to come back here in 1958. In Tobik First Nation, there was a human rights conference. And one of the speakers is a guy named Jerry Gamble. Now, Jerry was a former Indian Affairs employee. Now, the reason he was former is because he was fired. He was viewed as being too close to the Indians. But he wrote this paper and gave this speech called Stealing Indian Rights, where he's disclosing all of the internal ways that the government continues to do this. And um, so one of them is a, that I want to, I'm just going to focus on a few of them here. And one of them is the Be Patient speech. Now, see if this sounds familiar. Yeah, we know there's First Nations out there without any water. But we're working as hard as we can. We've done more than any other government. Change cannot happen overnight. We are 
Um, you know, this is complex, and we need to get out there to talk to First Nations people. I mean, God forbid, they might say they don't want water. <laughs> the be patient speech is always given by those who can turn on their tap and get a clean glass of water. All right? And the invitation, as Gary Jamble says, is when they alleviate even a little bit of it, that we're supposed to be thankful. Okay, well, be thankful that there's not everybody, you know, some of you got clean water. You gotta be happy with that. Whereas in the vast majority of the Canadian population, like I can't name one community, non-Indigenous, that doesn't have clean water going, right? Even here after the storm or hurricane, if people were out here in force to turn on the water, and good. But why is that not happening an hour and a half outside of Toronto? And we, we also, we excuse things, as Gary Gamble says. We overcomplicate, complicating. When you hear the word complicate, that's an excuse. That's a dog whistle. And it works, it's a colonial dog whistle. They'll say things like, um, you know, only 35% of First Nations homes have broadband access. And this is what I told to my students who were whining about Zoom during the pandemic. I said, you are so lucky to be able to get on the internet and Zoom. There, our social justice issue is the 65% of First Nations folks who don't have broadband and don't have this as a choice for their education. But the government will say, well, it's complex getting it out. And they make this sound like we live in these far-flung places, right? And so often uh, it's like the remote communities are up there. But if they discover diamonds or oils, they'll have an airstrip in there in like 24 hours, right? <laughs> but what I say to them is, think of the space station. Population six has clean drinking water and some of the best high-speed access that you'd find on the planet. Right? But it's these rationalizations that we have drank through the years that even get us on the First Nations side accustomed to this. And for those of you who don't know, those inequalities that Bryce talked about are exactly what we're litigating about in this First Nations case. The federal government funds public services for First Nations folks on reserve. And health services as well off reserve. But the ones for the non-Indigenous folks are funded at a, high, a much higher level by the provinces. And we're still trying to eke our way to equality. And when they eke our way to equality, as Natan Obed said of the Inuit Tupperset Katanami, he said, the fact that I can get clean water in my communities is not reconciliation. That's not reconciliation. That's a fundamental human right, you know? And so we get taught this reconciliation gets reprofiled as, he, uh, as something like, we well, gotta be thankful or we're getting you clean drinking water. How do I start into this? And how did my mindset start it? I started like Bryce. I, I worked with people far smarter than I was, First Nations folks from across the country. We saw the, the numbers of First Nations kids going into care at higher rates than in residential school. We looked at the funding. The First Nations kids were getting 70 cents on the dollar. And that's the only, that no, wasn't the only area they were underfunded in. It's education, everything. Imagine if I was Prime Minister and cut all your public services by 50 to 30 percent. That's a reality for these kids. So I was convinced that if we got the government around the table and we did a report and we documented all this, we put, showed how it was hurting kids and separating families and we provided them a solution, they would do the right thing. And they didn't. They wrote us a nice letter, and then they said they wanted another report, which I get sucked into the second time. But then we had a, we were creating the Caring Society thanks to Gary Sacobi. Over at the Fredericton Inn, every time you drive by there, that's a birthplace of the Caring Society thanks to Gary. And by then, we started to wise up that these guys are not gonna do anything. So we have to get ourselves ready to do something else. And that something else was filing a human rights complaint against Canada, saying that their underfunding of these children was racial discrimination. But here's the glitch. The federal government funded every single First Nation. They funded every First Nations Child and Family Service Agency, and they even funded us. 
So if we bit the hand that fed us, we would be disappeared and then who would take on the litigation? That was the question. But we had a great teaching from an elder and he said, I was so excited, we actually had our first phone as a caring society. Like I, and I remember you could call us and someone could answer on the other side, right? Because you're so broke all those years. And the elder, just as I was celebrating the phone line, he said, never fall in love with the caring society and never fall in love with your business card. Only fall in love with the children because there will come a day when you have to sacrifice both those things for them. And that came in 2007. The Assembly of First Nations and the Caring Society filed this human rights case. And even then I was so silly, I thought, now they know we're serious and they'll take action. And they did. They cut all of our funding within 30 days. So when we look back at 2005 and you, you hear about the $40 billion thing, this is what we said in 2005. The cost of Canada doing nothing could result in Canada being found vicariously liable for discriminatory funding and child welfare, knowingly resulting in harm and disadvantage for another generation of First Nations children. The political fallout will be substantial, especially on the heels of residential schools. That's exactly what happened, right? Again, the government didn't fail to implement it, they chose not to do it. And they relied on the Canadian population to be bathed in the same way it had in Bryce's time, right? Now, I want to show you what was happening to kids. Now, you might ask yourselves, well, maybe they didn't really understand. Well, these are their own documents, some of them that were filed in evidence. And um, you can see here, this is from 2006. This is a briefing note by the Deputy Minister. Circumstances are dire. Inadequate resources may require force individual agencies to close down. That's, on the far right, is their website back then. And on their website, they said the inequitable resources is driving more kids into care, right? Um, current issue, First Nations children disproportionately represented in the child welfare systems. Placement rates on reserve reflect a lack of available prevention services, right? That they knew all this. They were choosing not to do it. Even when we were litigating against them on Jordan's principle, they would publicly say there are no Jordan's principle cases. This is one of the cases that came to their attention, a four-year-old little girl who went in for routine dental surgery and wasn't able, uh, had a, a bad situation happen to her hospital. It, her, the mom is uh, pregnant and she's about to give birth to another baby. A request comes in to a, for a medical bill bed so she doesn't suffocate. It goes through the hands of 15 different public servants before someone says absolutely not. This is our tax money. I'm telling you, like whenever I see that coming off my paycheck, I think this is exactly the kind of stuff I wanted to pay for, right? But you can see inside of the department how this becomes the defense is against any misuse of public funds. That's the priority. And people have so dehumanized these children that it makes these types of decisions possible. So the tribunal, when it made its decision, it keeps on talking about Canada's old mindset. It orders Canada to reform itself and, and stop discriminating. It would take 22 non-compliance orders to start getting there. That's since 2016. That's what this government that has adopted reconciliation, right? So you can see how hard, when, when Graydon says hard fought, it really was hard fought, right? We're still fighting against these guys. Um, so what, is, what explains this? Isn't it we just have a particularly nasty group of people who end up in a federal government? That's, that, that's sometimes the easy fix, but that's not true. Um, so I, I was literally in my living room vacuum. And I was getting ready to go to court in 2021, um, and just after the discovery of the children at Tecamloos. And everybody in Parliament was uh, talking about it, and I was bored enough to be watching CPAC while I was doing this. And the allegation was thrown at the Prime Minister that he is fighting against First Nations kids in court. 
The Prime Minister stands up in response and says, we are not fighting Indigenous kids in court. And I literally dropped my vacuum cleaner. <laughs> because on the Monday, we're going to federal court because they don't want to pay any compensation and they don't want Jordan's principal off reserve. I, said, I couldn't help myself, it just came out. I said, QAnon, right? That's what it is. And then I thought, you know, that sounded stupid, but actually, that's what I, maybe that's true. Maybe it's like the, the department is like a cult. And then if, like, if that's true, then how have we all been thinking about this? Why is it that we're not up in arms as much as we should be? Why is it that we have go-to strategies that usually don't work very well, the negotiating table or the roadblock, right? So I, uh, long story short, I connected with this guy named Stephen Hassan. He wrote the book, The Culture Trump. And we started to think about colonialism and mind control. Now let me tell you where we're going with this. This is an experiment that we're under. So how does it work? You start off and you say, I'm a salmon. And we're using salmon here because you folks have never really had real salmon. You got the Atlantic salmon. Uh, you know, I know you like to think you got salmon, but you're talking get sad girl here. We got the old sockeye salmon. OK, there we go. Thank you. Another truth teller in the back. So I'm a sockeye salmon, and I will always be a salmon. And then what you do is you throw in some authoritarianism, a threat, perceive a threat, uh, trying to get fear or uh, anger. Is, uh, those are the two best motivators if you're trying to do something that's um, unjust. So maybe it's kind of like, they're going to take away your jobs if you let these people in. Right? You start hearing that on the radio. And, um, or you start hearing things like, well, you're not really First Nations. I mean, you didn't really grow up on reserve, right? And then you start thinking, well, I am still a salmon, but I'm not really like the other sockeye salmon, right? And then more confusion gets added in there. And then you start to do what we all naturally will do is there's something wrong with me, right? You get that feeling there's something wrong with you. And then there's more into undue influence applied. Like when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, it was not cool to be First Nations. It was in dangerous to be First Nations. I was out there pine cone picking in the bush, and little did I know that Indian agents were hunting for kids just like me, right? Um, then, it, so it, it's not cool to be First Nations, right? It hurts when I think I'm a salmon. And then you add more undue influence and you say, well, actually, I'm not a salmon, I'm a fish. Feels a bit safer to be a fish. And then you get, I've never heard of a salmon, I'm a fish. Now, we can see this with colonialism on the impacts of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. But I want to think of us to think about how this affected the other side. So, with the Pope's apology, when I saw people like being grateful to him for having come all this way and all the rest of it, and they were literally paving roads in First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities that had never been paved in 40 years, right? And I thought, why wouldn't we be paving these roads for the survivors? Why are we paving it for the representative of the wrongdoer, right? So I'm so frustrated down in Melbourne, Australia, I could not help myself that I did a to-do list for the Pope, right? This is how you give things meaning. And it's kind of like, get rid of, the, um, get rid of the papal bowl that gives the doctrine of discovery. He could have done something like that. Talk about how you've reformed the church to make sure that the sexual abuse cases that are coming up worldwide with the church are actually going to be dealt with. There are serious things that could be done. The, pap the pope, uh, we've heard about the return of documents. Well, remember that the Catholic Church is unique in that it's both a country and it's also a church. What we've heard from the Catholic Church is that the church has disclosed all the records. But what about the Holy See? Were any of those records for residential schools funded through, the, through a diplomatic pouch out, a pouch out of the country? Well, these are the types of things that they could do to make it real, right? So how do I start go from thank you for coming all this way to say, asking about the meaning of it. Well, let's look at what's happening with the public servants. 
So you start off in the threshold. I have strong morals, and I want to make a change from the inside, right? That's what you're going in there for. Then the first thing is, you know, oh, you think that? Well, you know, you're just new. Just wait till you've been here a while, OK? Then uh, supervisors will say, you know, you keep on raising a lot of questions. Haven't you heard what the minister has been saying? I.e., do you like your paycheck? That's kind of the code for that. Then you start to notice everybody else seems to be on the same boat. Like everybody else, no one else seems to be raising a stink. Maybe you didn't understand this as well as you thought. So you start to ask yourself, what's wrong with you? And then you get some more kind of influence in there. And you, it's like, you better not rock the boat. Right? I need this job. I got, a, I got kids, I got a responsibilities, I need this job. So then there's more undue influence. And once you're across that threshold, you then have to legitimize the immoral actions. And then it becomes a problem on the other side. I am working my butt off. Why aren't people appreciating what I'm doing? And you know the crazy thing? They are working their butts off. But it's often in service of the minister, the briefing notes to the minister versus the briefing notes to uh, the service to the public. And then you get down there, and you're at a place where you say, I'm a loyal public servant, and nothing we ever do is good enough for people. Right? That's the slide. And I want to say that this is a typology of what can happen. And at every one of these stages, you have an opportunity to disrupt the system so that it goes back to that ethical base. Right? And one of the easiest things to do is when you get that pit in your stomach that, this isn't right, is to really listen to that. And, and not get so much into groupthink, right? When you get into that groupthink, that's when your ethical stuff can get swamped. Or when you get into simple things, if you're thinking dichotomies, right? That is a problem. That actually contributes to a lot of racism and intolerance in the world. Let me give you an example. I have two neighbors sitting on the same block. Uh, they both have kids. And the question is, how well are these people going to get along? So they both have kids, and they, and, uh, they both go to the, uh, the, the kids all go to the same school and seem to get along. It's looking good so far, right? You know? Uh, they actually like biking. All of them do. Something of family activity, also looking good. But one of the neighbors, he's into barbecue. And the other neighbor's a vegan. But still, we can see them kind of getting along, right? They might have different picnics when they go biking, but they're still good. One of them is a Trump supporter. One of them is a Democrat. You see how those multiple identities, they get down, and it becomes only about that, about being a Republican or being a Democrat. And that, that when you're at that place, you're, you've dehumanized all those other parts of that person. Right? And, and that's actually my critique of the word indigenous. I personally don't use it. I think it, it, it dehumanizes us by uh, providing kind of a one quick word. I always at least make the effort of saying First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And people who were criticized me when this first started happening, because being indigenous was a cool thing, right? And it was like, Cindy, you're from the fossil era. You got to get on board. We use indigenous, and now we don't use the term aboriginal. To which I said, look, I actually took the time to check them out in the old dictionary, where they come from. And both of them actually turn out to be Western words. And they both mean roughly the same thing from the beginning. But one of them, Aboriginal, actually is protected in the charter under uh, respects Aboriginal rights and title. The other one, Indigenous, doesn't really have a lot of legal weight. So if I have to be classified according to a colonial term, I want the one that recognizes rights and title and not the other one. There's always a reason why government wants to change their name, I think. So um, I'm just going to get across this. So uh, we did this, and now how to get out of it. So what I started here, down here, the government must know, must not know it's underfunding these kids. Otherwise, it would be doing something about it. 
I'm going to get together with folks smarter than I am. We're going to write a report. And this is for academia, by the way, is I think a huge problem. We actually do not go back and look at the reports that are already on the file. Had I gone back, I would have seen Dr. Bryce's work. I would have seen a stack of reports this high, making the same recommendations over and over and over again. It wasn't that the solution wasn't known. It's that there was no implementation. And I think we as an academic community need to accept responsibility for that. And then, oh, we did the report, but they wanted another one. Well, OK, sounds a bit fishy, but what the heck, right? We're going to do it. They're going to fund us to do it. So we do it. Then finally, the penny drops. They're not going to do anything, right? But then I said, we're going to file that course, court case, then they're going to know we're serious. Then they're going to do something, <clears throat> right? Then I started uh, realizing, uh, and it was good that we were cut 100% of our money because no longer did we had no money to uh, negotiate. Uh, roadblocks for kids, probably not a good idea. So we had to start thinking creatively about how to deal with this. And we actually, through that creativity, really reclaimed what I think is one of the most important things, and it was taught by the children, is that we can go out and talk to children of all diversities about fairness. They're experts in love and fairness. They understand when something's not, is not fair, and they are, haven't been bathed in the colonial bathwater of all of us, so they don't make excuses for it. You know, they really, they will act on it. And so thousands and tens of thousands of children of all ages would be writing letters to the prime minister. And I occasionally would get a letter from a parent asking if I was making the children political, to which I would say, absolutely I am, over here, right here. I said, but I am not making them partisan. What I'm teaching them to do is that when you have something wrong, they have a person they can write to who can make a decision to make things right, right? And the children were in a courtroom, too, while we're litigating this. Now, imagine the power of that. You're Canada's lawyers. You're litigating against these children. You turn around, you say, maybe a group like yourselves. That would be intimidating. But imagine seeing a group of 10-year-olds packed in there with teddy bears. That was the reality of this case. And children could see the unfairness far before adults could. So then they started retaliating. Right? Again, so they, uh, you know, some of you might see, I know I look like a national security threat, and to Canada I probably was. So they had 189 different bureaucrats following me around, and uh, they would note when I was at meetings, when I wasn't at places. They followed me on social media. They did all this crazy stuff. Um, and what they're trying to do there is actually take the focus away from the children and make me the victim. And the moment I would, uh, and what was important for me in that moment is that I did not allow that to happen. That I took a breath and I figured out what I was going to do with this. Was it justice that I wanted or retaliation I wanted? If it was retaliation, I was playing right into their hands, right? So what I ended up doing there is I got all the documents from the government through a privacy request. I go on to a national news program, and I read right from the documents, but I won't reveal any of the public servants' names. Because you cannot stand up for a right while you're violating a right. And I knew that that would freak them out inside the government, and they would start writing more notes. And that's exactly what they did. And then I found out it was to uh, try to get the case thrown out on vexatious grounds, right? But that's the kind of stuff they're going to throw at you. And then you get to a place where I was using the word failure for a long time for the government. Now I use the word choose. It's a choice. And um, I don't do photo ops. That's the government's currency, right? I don't, uh, meeting with the government is often not worth it, right? Uh, uh, they know what I want. I know what they want. Um, sometimes it's worth meeting with them, but I, we have to make sure there's an environment where they can change. And that's where all of you come back in, to the picture. Eva Jewell and Ian Mosby, two fabulous historians, who every year through the Yellowhead Institute track the TRC's calls to action. They noted that when the sea of orange shirts happened last, in 2021, the government of Canada implemented more TRC calls to action in the following six weeks than it did in the previous six years. 
So what Samuel Hume Blake knew, what Dr. Bryce knew, what, many, what that child knew, is when the public pays attention, the government will act. All of these complications go away. So what has changed from this collective effort, a breaking kind of that mindset? Well, we now have, for the first time ever in the whole history of the country, services that are being funded by the federal government to keep families together instead of take them apart. We're not totally done yet, but it's far better than it was. We have gone from zero Jordan's principal cases, like in the case of that little girl, to over 1.3 million services probably over the last couple of years. Um, we have uh, children on and off reserve being eligible for Jordan's principal. We have capital. We can actually build buildings that bring dignity to children that are fit for purpose. Um, but we're not going to get sucked in by one key thing here with the government. They announced $19.08 billion for five years. I'm not interested in non-discrimination for five years. This case has been going on now for 16 years. I'm 58. And I figure, I see Eleni Sobomsawin, who is 90, and she's still at it. So if the feds don't cave soon, I have another work plan for another 50, 40 years, right? <laughs> Even if we win this case, though, do not look away, because these inequalities still remain. We have apartheid public services here in Canada. That's what we have. You know, many people, Canadians, got up with South Africa with Mandela, and they went and and stood against the, the fall of the apartheid system and then walked right past their Indian Affairs building. Didn't even think that we still have the Indian Act that decides when a baby is a status or non-status. Imagine your child, if I said, first judgment of government, are you a status child or a non-status child? That's the government. And they actually even use the word status to make us feel like it's like a perk card, like my super elite card from Air Canada, right? <laughs> when what it really means is that you're a ward of the government, right? This is the kind of colonial thinking that's still entrenched. So we have the Spirit Bear Plan that's cost out all those inequalities and address them. Leadership adopted it in 2017. Canada hasn't moved on it. But if you do wear your orange shirt into the voting booth, if you don't look away, this stuff all of a sudden becomes possible. You see, at the end of the day, Canada's creation story started with that colonial narrative. But you all hold the pen now. And if you can stop kind of reflexing so easily when they say it's complex, and you ask, well, really, is it? Um, or when they say they've done everything they can, then why aren't you asking, then, why aren't you doing this other stuff? Like, I mean, this is nonsense. They have said, for example, like when they rolled out COVID uh, money, my mother said, she said, Cindy, they can do it. They can cut checks and print money overnight. So why have they been fighting against these kids for all these years and claiming that they were broke, right? We need to start questioning some of those pieces and declaring ourselves free inch by inch, word by word. And if we do that, we'll have a country where First Nations kids never have to recover from their childhoods and a country where non-Indigenous kids never have to say they're sorry. And that's the world I want to live in. Thank you. And three cheers to our fabulous technician person here who has been keeping me honest all night. And <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so um, it's 8 o'clock. I don't want to take into too many people's time. But if you have a question or a comment or a reflection, then if you can come down to the mic. Yeah, one thing I will say is sometimes people want to share with me uh, individual cases, and I just ask that we not do that tonight because those are sacred stories for children that need to be told at another time. But if not, then there's a, there's a plan B, and that is that we all go outside for cake. And if you have questions, you can also answer them there, ask them there as I'm circulating around. So I'll wait a few minutes. It's, it's always like this. This is part of the mindset stuff. Nobody moves. Somebody out there is thinking, will I go up to the mic? They're looking around to see if anybody else is going up to the mic. Because if you're second at the mic, it's better. Now, here's our person. And also, may I say, it's a fellow Sockeye Salmon fan. <laughs>
<laughs> Hello, Cindy. Hi. Thank you for coming to Fredericton. I only saw the poster today in my office, and um, I had to come. So glad you did. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge where we live. And we live on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq, Uwalistikwe, and Passamaquoddy territory. I am a provincial government employee. Mm. And that's the first time I've felt safe to say, make that comment. As some of you Brunswickers know why but I will continue to make this statement publicly at any meetings. I also just celebrated my first year of working for the Department of Aboriginal Affairs for the government of New Brunswick. I chose to come to this department after nine, 19 years with tourism, heritage, and culture and I chose to come to this department after Kamloops. Mm. I am a civil servant, but I just want to make a statement that human beings like you inspire a number of us in the department. And uh, Everything you said about civil servants and the bureaucracy, bureaucracy, sorry, is true. Part of me is ashamed to say I work where I work, but part of me is here to say that there is a number of us that stay even because and in spite of the political climate where we do not agree with what is happening and we show up every day because we believe in everything you've just said. So keep saying it and many of us non-Indigenous people want to even learn how to do more and to show that we are quote unquote allies and we are doing things behind the scene. And I, I just wanna share that with you because we know what the climate is in this province. And some of us have stood up and yes, yeah, some of us have feared losing our jobs. But at this point in my life, if they walk me out the door, they walk me out the door. Well, and I think the message from all of us needs to be, if they walk you out the door, they walk all of us out the door. And um, I want to just say thank you, you know, um, for what you said. Because, thank you. you know, one of the things that we saw, and for civil servants that are out there, is just write the truth. In the records, we also found stories of courage among public servants. That guy who wrote The Circumstances Are Dire. Thank you very much for writing that. Because that was convincing evidence for the tribunal. There were times that we saw people doing that. What we needed to do, though, is we as public need to support those kinds of folks in our civil service. And we also need protection laws against retaliation for public servants. Effective ones. Not just cosmetic ones. Because we really want public servants to serve the public. Right? And that means that we need to stand with the good ethical servants, uh, public servants that are out there. So thank you for your comment. All right. Well, I think we're done. I want to thank all of you. You'll see me out there at the snack station. I am a junk food addict. Uh, you'll find me not at the healthy section. It's somewhere over by the cheesies and chips, assuming that they're there. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Graydon. Thank you, judges, for having me here this evening. A real honor.
going to close off this formal uh, portion of the evening, but I do hope that you'll all join us outside. And, and thank you so much, Cindy, uh, for offering to stay and, and chat over junk food. <laughs> but especially thank you for your, your talk. Um, it was real, it was true, it was hard, um, but also a really significant, important call to action uh, for all of us. And so thank you so very much for being here. And this was a wonderful first um, talk in, in our new um, lecture series. So, so thank you so much. And I, I do believe and trust that we'll all walk away here with some new things to think about. And like you kind of called us to, to action. And I, I love the way you closed off about uh, wanting a new world for children, um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous or other words that might be better than Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but where the children aren't afraid and no one has to say they're sorry. So thank you so much.